olfaction is the sense of smell. We're going to detect odorants. And what odorants are are molecules. Um, average human, we can differentiate between 10,000 different odors. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, that having been said, compared to the rest of the animal kingdom, we are really lame for our sense of smell. Uh, just to give you some perspective, here's our little olfactory bulb in red right down there. Um, there's, let's see, there's a hedgehog olfactory bulb. There's a polar bear olfactory bulb. There's a domestic cat olfactory bulb. Um, so basically every animal aside from us probably has a way more awesome sense of smell than we do by a lot. <laughs> Yeah, that's why they sniff each other's butts, right? They, they're getting a lot more information than we are out of it. <laughs> so smell is actually a really, really primitive sense. Um, we're going to have a couple of different pathways for smell, but the basic way that smell functions is very, very simple. Once again, we're going to have these two different cell types. And here we're going to have our hair cells. We're going to have olfactory cells that are also going to have microvilli. They're going to have little hair-like projections into this mucus layer in the nasal cavity. And then, of course, we're going to have support cells and basal cells. Now, the location of this, let's put this into context here. We are on the superior and a little bit lateral and posterior surfaces of the nasal cavity. So when you smell, you inhale air into your nasal cavity, right? You have your nasal conche. They're also called turbinates. They make turbulent flow for the air inside of your nasal cavity, and that means that molecules that are dissolved in the air have a chance to connect and attach and be embedded in this mucus layer. And then those molecules can diffuse over to the olfactory hairs, and that can trigger action potentials to fire in those olfactory cells. And now this olfactory cell is continuous. This is the olfactory nerve. The olfactory nerve are these olfactory cells in the olfactory epithelium. That's what we call this, olfactory epithelium. This is the olfactory nerve. Then it goes up to the olfactory bulb through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. When I had you learn that cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, I was not being arbitrary because it connects us to the idea of the sense of smell and there's clinical relevance to that. Uh, do you guys remember how we test sense of smell for cranial nerves? What's the cranial nerve test for sense of smell? Coffee. Smell this coffee. Do we do the coffee test for everyone? No, when do we do the coffee test? What's up? If they've been punched to the face, if there's been an airbag deployed and you think something's happened to the middle of their face, you're worried about that cribriform plate breaking and severing the olfactory nerve. That's what you're worried about in that scenario, that right there. And again, this is the olfactory nerve. When it gets to the olfactory bulb, it synapses. After that synapse, we no longer call it the olfactory nerve. After that synapse in the olfactory bulb, everything on the way back is actually olfactory tract. That's something I kind of neglected in AMP1 because you had enough on your mind to, without differentiating nerves from tracts. So the first neuron in the circuit, that's the nerve. After a synapse, it's a tract. It's a little bit semantic, but I do expect you to know that. Uh, here's another image. This is poorly portrayed in this sense, but you can get a better view of the olfactory hairs. Uh, there's a problem. Some sources are going to refer to these as olfactory cilia. What's the difference between cilia and microvilli? Cilia move, microvilli are about what again? Surface area. So these are properly categorized as microvilli, not cilia. But depending on which resource and which system you're in, we're going to see this word cilia again when we get to our auditory system. Um, special senses, some jerk back in the day decided to use these terms interchangeably in special senses. I don't know who it was. I'd like to punch their face and sever their olfactory nerve. Um, but I can't do that. So part of the reason this picture is here is to show you that if you go to outside sources, that semantic thing is there. And just to clarify, they are microvilli. These are not mobile. They are about surface area. Which is why sometimes I just go straight to olfactory hair 
or why I like saying hair cell so much is because you, you kind of avoid that whole trap entirely, you know. Questions, comments? Okay. Uh, let's see. Olfactory epithelium. Olfactory epithelium is different from respiratory epithelium. You may remember res respiratory epithelium from our um, issues lecture back in the day, right? Slightly different. The difference is these neurological cells that are in there, right? The olfactory receptor cells. There is clinical relevance for the difference between olfactory epithelium and respiratory epithelium. That's why I'm talking to you about it. In fact, let's go back here for a second and look at this phrase, uh, peanut butter test for Alzheimer's. Have you guys heard of that one? Yeah. What do you guys think about the peanut butter test for Alzheimer's? Do you have an opinion? What's that? Probably. Yeah, I probably did tell you guys about it a little bit. Um, it might be legitimate. There might be something to it. One thing we find with olfaction is that with age, we lose olfactory epithelium. So let's say you sniff some bleach or you sniff some steam, you are actually going to damage your olfactory epithelium. Now this is a peripheral nerve. This is a cranial nerve. It can recover. But through a lifespan, every time your olfactory epithelium tries to recover, respiratory epithelium is going to encroach. So by the time you are very old, you'll have very little olfactory epithelium, and most of this surface is going to be respiratory epithelium. So that may be one reason why people with dementia cannot smell peanut butter. It could be related to degradation of some of the parts of their brain responsible for receiving that sense of smell. But then you would wonder why it's specific to peanut butter. Either way, you would wonder why it's specific to peanut butter. So yeah. When they do that, um, for the first time, their eyes close? Because I feel like they know what peanut butter smells like, but never able to say. That's a legitimate question. I don't know. Um, I've, I've never seen the peanut butter test administered. I imagine it would be more effective if they have their eyes closed so they don't know that it is, in fact, peanut butter. Yeah. Because we will trick, our brains will trick us into thinking we've sensed something, even if we haven't. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Uh, olfactory nerve. Its synapses in the olfactory bulb. After that, we call it the olfactory tract. And I think in AMP1, I kind of had you focus on the olfactory cortex being mesomedial frontal lobe um, instead of what I actually had written in the AMP1 slides. And this is why. This is the real pathway for olfaction. It's actually going all over. I'm not putting the slide here for you to memorize it. I'm putting the slide here for you to see it really actually does go to a lot of different places. I still want you to focus on it going to the basomedial frontal lobe, just to keep it consistent between AMP1, AMP2, and pathophysiology. If you haven't written it down, I would annotate basomedial frontal lobe for olfactory cortex. It actually is the same thing as orbitofrontal cortex. Those things mean the same thing. Any questions about that? Yeah, go for it. Olfactory cortex. So that olfactory tract is then going to project to the olfactory cortex, which we're going to just simplify and say is in basomedial frontal lobe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I got a laugh out of that one. He's been up there for a really long time and like since even before really the Marvel movies started having vision in them. So it's only recently that people have started laughing at that. <laughs> it's only since Endgame, or not Endgame, uh, Infinity War that people started laughing about it. Okay, are we ready for vision or do we wanna think about anything else associated with olfaction? Yeah. Baso, as in uh, basal, sir, B A S O, medial. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, I, again, I want to clarify that those odorants, they are molecules. And that has the implication of anything you smell, that means it is inside your face. So if you walk by a gutter and you smell something nasty, that thing that's in the gutter, molecules of it are in your face. 
And I'm sorry you can ever unlearn that. You know it now. It's too late. Okay. Uh, vision is really one of our more complex things. We're going to spend a lot more time on vision than we have on really anything so far. And then even more time on auditory. Uh, so receptors for vision reside in the eye. The eye is a pretty complex structure. A lot of things in the eye anatomically that you need to learn. Again, in order to prepare you for pathophysiology, for all of the things that can go wrong in the eye, right? This is all foundational. Um, you've got some external eye anatomy. You have eyelashes and eyebrows. Surprise! Uh, externally, you can see the iris. That's the pigmented portion. The pupil is actually a space. It appears black, uh, but it is actually simply an opening. Uh, we're going to have the, let's see, palpebral commissures and fissures. Palpebra, we're just talking about eyelids. So if this palpebral fissure just means your eye is open, that's all. Uh, the eyelashes are supposed to prevent foreign objects from contacting the eyes, and of course they, they become the thing they sought to destroy and are the main thing that go into your eyes, but, you know, nothing I can do about that. Uh, you do have, let's see, tarsal glands within the eyelids, so you're going to have some special spacious glands to prevent tear overflow, to prevent the eyelids from sticking together, that's always good. You've got a conjunctiva, and that conjunctiva is pretty significant. Um, it is a stratified squamous epithelium. Would you expect this to be keratinized or non-keratinized? Non-keratinized, thank goodness. Um, that conjunctiva is also con going to contain goblet cells that will help moisten the eye. And that is continuous. So I'll show you here. I may go up. So there's this like sort of white conjunctiva illustrated here. It does a little U-turn. So the part of the conjunctiva is adhere to the sclera, the whites of the eyes. And then it does a U-turn right here, and then it's adhered to the eyelid on this side. So it's almost got like a visceral and parietal layer in a way. Nobody calls it that, but. Um, so there's a dead end here. Some people are paranoid. Oh, I got something stuck in my eye. It's going to go behind my eye and back to my brain, and I'm going to die. That can't really happen thanks to the conjunctiva. So that's good news, right? Has anybody ever had that freak out before? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, contact lenses. Uh, do you guys hear, guys hear about that one woman who had, like, 32 eye things in her eye? Yeah. So she had them all embedded, you know, in, like, this sort of periphery of the conjunctiva. They weren't behind her eye or anything like that. They yeah. would have been collected. <laughs> so thank goodness for conjunctiva. They do prevent things from touching your eyes directly, right? Things can still touch your eyes indirectly, but now they can't touch them directly. Uh, there's a ton of eye anatomy. We can kind of start here. Uh, one major point of confusion is the difference between the cornea and the lens. So the cornea is the superficial structure. That's the one you could hypothetically poke with a cotton swab. Please don't. And then the lens is this deeper structure right here. This lens is going to be the one that changes shape and helps us to focus. Okie dokie. Let's see. Um, got some musculature too. I can't remember if I have any muscles on this list. We've covered, we've talked about these muscles a few times, the extrinsic eye muscles, right? Superior rectus, lateral rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus. Superior oblique, inferior oblique, that do all these eye movements, right? Um, but I can't remember if they're on your list. Or not. Lacrimal apparatus. So fun fact, your tear glands, your lacrimal gland, it's actually going to be laterally located. And then you're actually going to drain the tears from the lateral side to your, of your eye to the medial side. And then at that lacrimal caruncle, that's where you're going to have drainage into the lacrimal sac and through the nasal lacrimal duct and into the nasal cavity. So when you're crying and your nose is running and you're all disgusting and gross, uh, those tears are coming into your nasal cavity from your lacrimal apparatus, not the other way around. Well, thankfully, not the other way around. Um, they're not coming from here either. They just tend to spill over. 
So remember that lacrimal bone, right? That has that sort of divot in it that's actually a foramen. That's going to connect into that lacrimal duct. Those tears have a few functions. They're going to moisten the eye. They're also going to contain lysozyme, which is going to help break down any bacteria that make it onto the surface of the eye. So that's good news, too. We don't like bacterial infections in our eyeballs. So again, tear production just on a normal, everyday basis is pretty important clinically. Questions, comments? Uh, it's formed from the lacrimal gland, drains over the eye, and then drains into the nasal lacrimal duct and into the nasal cavity. Can you guys hear me all right? I'm like blocking one of my ears at a time, so I can't hear you guys very well. Just so you know. Okay, your eye has tunics. You've got layers. Actually, that's going to be a bit of a theme this semester where we talk about the layers of things. Um, anytime you have layers like this, as a general rule. One of the issues is that between each layer, there's going to be probably some like aerial or connected tissue, some kind of connected tissue between these two layers. And that's going to play out clinically a lot later on. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm having you learn these tunics today is that in pathophysiology, we're going to talk about something called retinal detachment. What happens when this tunic, the retina, detaches from the vascular tunic? because that's connective tissue. If you have a connective tissue, like genetic disorder, for example, that could be very weak and your retina could just burp, fall off. So you do have to learn these tunics for clinical reasons. You have your retina, you have your vascular tunic, which includes the iris, this thing called the ciliary body and the choroid. We will talk about that ciliary body in just a bit. And then the fibrous tunic includes the sclera and the cornea. So the cornea is this clear portion right here. It is continuous with the sclera, which is the whites of your eyes. So the cells are actually really, really similar. It's just these cells um, have altered to become this sort of clear consistency instead. So you should know each of the tunics and what is in them. Now there's going to be an issue here. Uh, you can still use superficial to deep, right? Be aware superficial is going to be fibrous tunic and then vascular and then deep is going to be the retina. The issue is going to come from when we start thinking about light coming in. So here comes light. It's coming in this way. It comes in through this opening of the pupil. It's transferred through that lens. It's going to hit the retina first. Right? So this deepest structure is going to be immediately impacted by, the, by light. Do you see why that's weird? We're having superficial versus deep in this context. It, it trips people up a little bit. There's going to be another image of the retina where we're going to use superficial versus deep, but we're still going to have to be considering where light is coming from. It gets more complicated. Okay, uh, cornea again, transparent. Uh, it is avascular. Because it's avascular, it's not getting oxygen and nutrients directly. It's going to have to get them from lacrimal fluid and aqueous humor. We will talk about the humors very soon. And then again, sclera is the white of the eye, and the cornea is continuous with the sclera. A layer deeper in the vascular tunic. Let's talk about that choroid and ciliary body. So here's the vascular tunic. We do obviously have blood vessels traveling here. So the other layers can get their nutrition from the vascular layer. You have some muscular features of the vascular tunic. The ciliary body is going to be comprised of ciliary muscles and processes. Those are going to attach to suspensory ligaments for the lens. The ciliary body is going to be suspending the lens effectively. And the contractions of the ciliary body are going to determine lens shape. 
and lens shape is going to determine your ability to focus. So you should know that what that ciliary body does and that it's part of the vascular tunic. The iris is also muscular. It is pigmented on the anterior surface, but it is also muscular in nature. You've actually got two different muscles going on in this iris with actually two different uh, branches of the nervous system impacting each of them. So you have a sphincter pupillae muscle that causes contraction of the iris, or sorry, contraction of the pupil. And that's parasympathetic innervation. Which one's parasympathetic? Is it rest and digest or fight and flight? It's rest and digest. Do you need a lot of light when you're just resting and digesting? No. So we're actually going to bring that down. And then dilator pupillae is going to contract. And it's got this sort of um, coronal pattern. It's all going out towards the edges there. And that's going to cause dilation of the pupil. And then that sympathetic, which is which division? Fight or flight, you're running from a bear, you need a lot of light. Your retina has a lot going on. Your retina actually has nine layers. I'm not going to have you learn all nine layers of the retina. You're welcome. All right, so remember when I was talking about superficial versus deep on this? It gets a little weird, right? You may have heard of rods and cones. Yep, rods and cones. Sound familiar? Here's the rods and cones. They're actually really close to that choroid. So here's the direction of light. Light is coming in, and it's going to go through all of these different layers of the retina before it gets to the actual rods and cones that are actually detecting light. So you have, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. So the light comes in. It's actually going to activate rods and cones, and then those rods and cones are going to fire, and they're going to send information actually back this direction. Through all of these different layers, all of these different layers, their purpose is to interact with each other, to excite or inhibit or modulate the actions of the other neurons. That's why you have all these layers. It's not going to be like a simple one-to-one -one correlation, thing happens, extra potentials fire, like it is in your nose, right? It's going to be modulated quite a bit before it even gets back to occipital lobe. Okay, so light comes in this way. Rods and cones are back here in the photoreceptor cell layer. Flow of information goes back out this way. And then all of these neurons from this layer here are going to collect, and they're going to go back to that optic nerve. Which number for cranial nerves? Two. Cranial nerve two. So there's this point right here called the optic disc. And one thing that's happening at this optic disc is it's all axons. There are no rods and cones. If you look closely at what this is representing histologically, there are no rods and cones here. Uh, let's see, pigmented in neural layers. Uh, la, 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 la. Here's the three layers that I do want you to know about the retina. Photoreceptor cell layer, bipolar cells in the middle, ganglion cells are actually going to be the deepest structure, but the first thing that light hits. And that's going to be the one that has axons that take part in cranial nerve 2, the optic nerve. So here's what your optic disc gets you. Here's your optic disc. It's also where blood vessels come into your... Uh, choroid. So it's your blood vessels come in through your eye at your optic disc as well. So there's going to be absolutely no photoreceptors here, no rods, no cones. This is going to give you a massive blind spot, a physiologic blind spot that we all have that our brain is choosing to ignore right now. And I will prove it to you later. So that's what this test is. And I have some of these in the lab. We'll do this as a lab activity. All of us, if we were looking straight ahead, our blind spots are all right about here. All of this is being filled in 
one from the other eye accessing it and two from your brain filling it in. When you close your eye and you can still think that you see all of this, you don't, your brain's filling it in from when you were scanning back and forth earlier. And I will prove this to you later that you have a giant blind spot. Um, clinical relevance there too, right? Like let's say you're driving down a highway for hours and hours and there's a car like right here, but you're just looking straight ahead. You're not sweeping your eyes side to side. That car could eventually disappear. This is probably a major source for car accidents, right? Us being unaware that we have this mass blind spot. That's why in driving school, they tell you to like keep sweeping your eyes over things. Read the sign, look at the line, look at the mirror, look at the mirror, look at the road, because your eyes need to be sweeping back and forth to compensate for that gigantic blind spot that we all have. Okay, so that's the optic disc. By contrast, the area of highest visual acuity is going to be the fovea centralis located in the macula lutea. So I'll go back to, I think it was represented on one of these, maybe not. Here's the fovea centralis on this image. Here's the optic disc. They're really close to each other, right? Here's the fovea. It's got a little indentation. This is going to be where the cones are, most of the cones. So you have your area of highest visual acuity and especially color acuity. Your ability to see color is very, very centralized on the fovea centralis. And this is another thing that I can prove to you later in the lab is that um, you're not actually detecting color in the periphery. Yet again, you've seen that wall, you know what color that wall is, and your brain is filling it in for you. If you had never seen that wall before and you were looking locked straight ahead, you would not be able to guess at the color at that wall successfully. And I can prove that to you with science. Is anybody else having their mind blown right now? It's a fun lab today. We're going to have a lot of uh, so here's histology. You can see these like nine layers of the retina over here and how they end at the optic nerve. So they've just labeled it ON instead of CN2, which would have been better. Um, you can see that there's just no retina here. It's all just axons traveling like this. Meanwhile, over at the fovea centralis, we do have a thinned portion with some modified arrangement of the retina, a very large number of cones, not that you can really see it very well there. When we say rods versus cones, uh, yeah, the cell has a slightly different shape, but it's really just about is it detecting color versus is it detecting like black and white in movement. So cones are detecting black and white in movement. Sorry, rods are detecting black and white in movement. Cones are detecting color. There's still more anatomically. We're not done. At this point, I usually like to draw a diagram. So some people may like doing the chambers and cavities sort of artistically and just from this image, but I like drawing it schematically because you, what you're going to have is an anterior cavity and a posterior cavity. Within the anterior cavity, you're also going to have an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber. Was that enough words to be confusing? So that's why we're going to diagram it. So I like to draw it kind of like a blueprint of an apartment. There's going to be a posterior cavity and an anterior cavity. And then that anterior chamber is going to be subdivided into a posterior chamber, or sorry, anterior cavity subdivided into a posterior chamber and an anterior chamber. And now I'm going to add on what these dividing lines are to make this a little bit more logistic. This dividing line between anterior cavity and posterior cavity is the lens. 
there's some membrane separating it. It's not just the lens, but that's on the surface. But for some technology, you can see it here, it's not too much. It's just you can see it as you can do it. Within the anterior cavity, separating the posterior chamber from the anterior chamber. This is the iris, and this is the pupil. Now the pupil is a space. That means that the posterior chamber is actually continuous with the anterior chamber. I wouldn't be making you memorize this if there were some very good reasons for it. This is also iris. It's schematic. So okay. yeah, think of it as like all the way around. Yep. Okay, here's what's going on with these cavities and chambers. In the posterior cavity, you have vitreous humor. If you're feeling European, you could put an extra U in there. It's up to you. Vitreous humor. In the anterior cavity, you have aqueous humor. And because the space is continuous, it does flow between posterior chamber and anterior chamber. Questions so far? Do you just want me to repeat it, or do you want to trust the recording to have it repeated to you a million times? Repeat it now? Okay. Your posterior cavity contains vitreous humor. It goes from the posterior part of your eye up to the lens. And the anterior cavity contains aqueous humor. It goes from the lens to the cornea. It is divided into a posterior chamber and an anterior chamber at the iris, but is continuous because of the pupil. What we're actually going to see with the aqueous humor is it's going to be synthesized in the posterior chamber. And it's going to flow and be reabsorbed through a sinus in the anterior chamber. All of this has clinical relevance to you. It's going to be a while before it pays off, but it's all relevant. In fact, here's the sinus. It's called the scleral venous sinus. According to your textbook, if you want to go old school with it, it's called the Canal of Schlem, S-C-H-L-E-M-M. -M. I know, right? It's a great word. Schlem. Canal of Schlem. Again, clinical relevance. The word glaucoma is going to come up for you one day. And you're going to hear about closed angle glaucoma and open angle glaucoma. And that has to do with the flow of aqueous humor through the chambers of the anterior cavity. It's going to be overabundant, either too much creation of aqueous humor, which happens, by the way, at the ciliary processes, or too little drainage. We can have a blockage of those sinuses. Scleral venous sinus can get blocked. And those are glaucoma. Um, so that aqueous humor is continuously being generated and cycled. Whereas vitreous humor is a little bit slower to be generated and cycled. That also has some clinical implications if you have a bleed into the posterior cavity. It's probably going to stick around a lot longer than if you have a bleed into the anterior cavity. Okay. Uh, again, the lens is held by suspensory ligaments, which are in turn attached to the ciliary processes of ciliary muscles. And those are going to determine lens shape. Uh, it is going to get a little counterintuitive here for a second. When the ciliary muscles contract, the lens actually gets more spherical. I did not say that backwards. When the ciliary muscles contract, contract the lens becomes more spherical. When the ciliary muscle relaxes, the lens becomes flattened. I have double checked it and triple checked it. It's not intuitive to me, um, but I said it the correct way. You guys believe me? Take my word for it. 
Is anybody else confused about why that would be? Yeah. I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> I've heard. Here's another image showing the synthesis of aqueous humor from the ciliary processes into the posterior chamber, and then it's going to circulate into the anterior chamber and drain through the scleral venous sinus. I actually do like this image in particular for cavities and chambers. Um, it's just really, really small. So I should be able to ask you about cavities and chambers on different images as well. Questions, comments? There's a lot going on in the eye, yeah. Uh, so it's gonna be, you know how there's like a blood-brain barrier and you have cerebrospinal fluid? It's going to be a non-blood fluid that can circulate nutrients, oxygen, things like that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's start talking about visual pathways. We've talked about pathway for every special sense. Visual pathway, we know it's cranial nerve 2. Uh, where's the visual cortex? Occipital lobe, excellent, very well done. Uh, we are going to go from the optic nerve to the optic chiasm. After that optic chiasm, that we then call it the optic tract. Remember that we're going to have that like nerve versus tract thing in all of these different pathways. It's going to stop by in the thalamus. It's going to start in a part of the thalamus specifically known as the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Uh, part of why I'm having you learn lateral geniculate nucleus for visual is there's also going to be a medial geniculate nucleus for auditory coming up in just a bit. And that's just nucleus of the thalamus. That just means it's synapses. And then after it synapses, it goes straight back to that occipital lobe. But wait, there's more. You're not out of the woods yet. Sorry, guys. This will be the last thing, and then we'll go on our next break. Okay. When I was in grad school, we did a lot with visual pathways. I actually thought it was a lot of fun once I got the hang of it, uh, but it took a while to get the hang of it. So I want to visually explain what's happening. This is the one from your textbook. I like this representation better. I think it's a lot cleaner. So remember, light does not bend. Light will go in a straight line. So if this is the right and this is the left, your right field of view is actually going to come in and hit your left retina. Are so good? Okay. And your left field of view is going to come in and hit your right retina. And that's going to be true for both your right eye and your left eye. You're going to have visual information coming in and hitting your retina in a straight line. Good? From there, both right and left visual field information travel via the optic nerve. The purpose of the optic chiasm, I finally get to tell you the purpose of the optic chiasm, is for same side information to cross over. So here is your right field of view in red. And it's coming in, and it's actually going to stay to the left. And here's your left field of view, and it's actually going to stay to the right. So here's this right field of view for the right eye coming and hitting left retina and at the optic chiasm it crosses the chiasm and it joins the right side information on the left. I know that's a lot of confusing rights and lefts in there. Hopefully the visual cues are helpful for that. But what this is getting at at the end of the day is that the same side of the field of view is going to go to the same side of the brain, or at least the contralateral side of the brain. Likewise, over on the left field of view, it's hitting the right side of the eye on both of them. This stays on the same side, but the right field of view information from the left eye crosses at the optic chiasm, joins that right field of view information on the right or sorry, left field of view information on the right. I said that wrong. Why is this important? Because you can have a lesion anywhere along this pathway, and you can have some really wacky field of view deficits. 
So remember when we were testing cranial nerve two, we had quadrants that we tested, right? How many fingers in this quadrant? How many fingers in this quadrant? How many fingers in this quadrant? This is actually simplifying it a bit by having it just be right and left. You can actually go make this more complicated and do quadrants as well, but I won't do that to you. So if you were to cut the uh, cranial nerve two, the optic nerve right here, if you want to understand what that lesion is going to do, you just kind of trace it back towards the eye and you imagine this field of view and this field of view are gone. This is the deficit that you would get if the lesion was located here. Let's say they had a pituitary tumor. That pituitary gland is right next to that optic chiasm. And that's going to impact just these midline, just the ones that are crossing over in the optic chiasm, potentially. But look at, trace it back to where the light's coming from. It's coming from the left in this case, and it's coming from the right in this case. So this person, this pituitary tumor lesion right here, that's going to have that visual deficit. And then if you had, let's say, uh, you're back in probably the parietal um, lobe at this point, you're, part, you're at the optic tract, and now there's a lesion there. Again, trace it back to where it's coming from. Left field of view on one side and left field of view. So you'd have this visual deficit for this lesion. Cool, right? And again, if you want to overcomplicate it, we can get into quadrants as well and have lesions that are just here or just there. And that would just do quadrants. Yeah. I mean, this one? It's like losing an eye, basically. Oh, yeah, if you're missing one eye, you'll lose your depth perception as well. Absolutely. That optic chiasm? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, you need an input from two different eyes, binocular vision, to give you depth perception. Absolutely. Okay, uh, that is it for here or for vision. Thank goodness, it's a long one. So I'm going to stop here.